<laughs> it's it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome uh, today's uh, colloquium speaker, Professor uh, Maura McLaughlin. Uh, she is a, an astrophysicist um, at the West Virginia University. Uh, is a distinguished professor and the director of the uh, Center for Gravitational Waves and Cosmology at the uh, university. Uh, she is an astrophysicist and interested in, in particular, study of neutron stars using radio, X-ray, and gamma ray observations. And in particular, the last decade or so, uh, she has been sort of playing a leadership role in the Nanograv collaboration, which is a pulsar timing array collaboration that is um, um, aiming to detect gravitational waves, low-frequency gravitational waves, by timing a large number of uh, millisecond pulsars. And uh, recently, she has been also playing a leadership role in the international also timing um, array, array collaboration. And today she is going to talk about some very exciting results from these uh, pulsar timing arrays, uh, showing even a possible detection of gravitational waves. You've given away my whole talk. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, hey, everybody, can everyone hear me fine? Yeah, okay. It's really nice to be here. Um, thanks so much for inviting me and hosting my visit. Um, it's my first time ever in Bangalore and my, definitely my first time here. It's a really beautiful campus. And anyway, it's really nice to be here. So I'm going to tell you about our project where we're using neutron stars, which we detect as radio pulsars, um, to detect very low frequency gravitational waves, which we believe will be emitted by supermassive black holes at the cores of galaxy mergers. So, oh, here it is. Okay. So let me just start by telling you a little bit about the collaborations that are part of this work. So I'm a member of NANOGRAV. It stands for the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. North American, because we're a collaboration of scientists in the US and Canada. Um, nanohertz, those are the frequencies of gravitational waves that we're sensitive to, very low frequencies. Here's a recent picture of us. Um, there's about 150 students and scientists that are members of NANOGRAV. We span about 50 institutions or so in the US. Um, we just revamped our website. Um, so if you want to learn more about us, you can go to nanograv.org. Nanograv is a member of a broader international pulsar timing array um, called the International Pulsar Timing Array, IPTA. And so this IPTA is kind of like a consortium of consortia. So it consists of Nanograv and then other regional collaborations in Australia, Europe, um, and now India. So the Indian PTA just joined this collaboration um, about a year ago or so, which is really exciting. Um, our last in-person meeting was actually here in India um, in June 2019, um, before the COVID pandemic. We're finally having another one this coming summer in Australia, but here's a picture from the student workshop um, in Pune, India. And if anything you hear you know, is interesting and you wanna learn more about it, we have student workshops every summer um, going forward, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, which are open to undergraduates, grad students, even postdocs or, you know, faculty from other fields. We also have a website. It's not as good as the Nanograv website, um, but you can go there and learn more about the International Pulsar Timing Array if you like. Okay. So big picture. Um, let me start by just posing the question that we want to answer through our experiment. So our goal as our pulsar timing collaboration is to try to understand not pulsars themselves, but to use them as tools to get at how galaxies evolve through cosmic time. So if we look at galaxies in the very early um, stages of the universe, right? So the first galaxies that were born, they're really small. They're kind of irregularly shaped. And then with time, we see that galaxies get larger and more regularly shaped, right? And we think that this has happened through subsequent mergers. So smaller galaxies have merged with other small galaxies to form bigger and bigger galaxies. So this is a fairly well-accepted picture for galaxy growth and evolution. Um, and you can, of course, see lots of evidence for this. We can see, you know, optically galaxies that are in the process of merging, and we can study this merger process at these wide separations. But there's a lot of really interesting astrophysics um, that happens at these very close separations. So in a galaxy like this, we can't tell this galaxy is the product of a merger just by looking at it, right? We can't look at this optical image and say, oh, that galaxy must be the product of a merger. The only way we know is by resolving this pair of black holes at the core of the galaxy. Um, this is something called the last parsec problem or the final parsec problem you may have heard of. 
Um, and basically the problem is like what astrophysics are responsible for bringing these black holes to close enough separations at the core of this merger that they can then merge due to gravitational wave emission and form a more massive black hole. So this is a, a really important astrophysical question. Um, how many binary systems actually get to that final stage? How many stall? And we wanna be able to answer this question through our pulsar timing array experiment. And of course, the only way we can do this is through gravitational waves. We can't resolve these black holes electromagnetically, so we need another tool. Um, I think everyone in this room knows what gravitational waves are. Um, you know, we know that there's a black hole at the core of every galaxy. Uh, many of these galaxies will be the products of mergers, we'll have pairs of black holes. Um, we can detect two different kinds of sources in nanograv. We can search for individual supermassive black hole binaries. Um, we can also search for a stochastic background. So the combined signal from all of the supermassive black hole binaries in the universe, that combined gravitational wave signal. I'll describe both of those searches um, in this talk. We think we're gonna see that stochastic background signal first, um, and then we'll start to see like individual binary sources kind of popping above the gravitational wave noise. Okay. So I think all of you know about LIGO. You have LIGO folks here, but just as like a quick refresher, um, indeed, LIGO has already detected gravitational waves. Um, it's been an amazing experiment. We know that LIGO is sensitive to you know, frequencies of like tens to hundreds of hertz, so high frequency gravitational waves, um, signals that occur within you know, sort of well less than a second time scale. Um, we also know that LIGO is sensitive to stellar mass black holes, so black holes with masses of like tens to 100 times the mass of the sun. Um, LIGO has detected you know, over 90 stellar mass um, black hole and neutron star mergers. So this is really exciting. Um, and just to kind of set the stage for the pulsar timing experiment, I'm just going to play a little video of how LIGO works. And again, I know this is review to many of you here, um, but I think it's nice to sort of see the analogy with pulsar timing arrays. So LIGO is composed of two four kilometer arms. Um, they're separated by 90 degrees. And the reason that there's a 90 degree separation is because of the quadrupolar nature of gravitational waves, right? So when a gravitational wave passes through LIGO, one arm is arms that this laser is traveling, and this is detected in this interference pattern here. Um, the same thing lies right at the core of our pulsar timing array experiment. So just like LIGO is searching for very tiny changes in light travel time of this laser, our experiment involves searching for very tiny changes in the distances to the pulsars in our array. Make sense? Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. I think this is all probably mostly review for folks in the audience here. So if we want to detect gravitational waves from billion solar mass black holes, from the most massive black hole binaries at the cores of these galaxy mergers, we need to build a much bigger detector, right? So our goal is to build a galactic scale detector um, and we're gonna build this galactic scale detector using pulsars. So pulsars are neutron stars. They're born in supernova explosions. Um, here's a little cartoon of a pulsar. Here's the neutron star. You can see the closed magnetic field lines here and the open magnetic field lines here. And particles are accelerated along these open magnetic field lines and they produce radio emission. In addition to emission across the electromagnetic spectrum, but everything I'll talk about in this talk is based on radio observations. Okay, and the subclass of pulsars that we are most interested in for our experiment are called millisecond pulsars. These are obviously pulsars that are rotating with millisecond periods, so the very fastest spinning pulsars. So these pulsars are very old, actually, and they've been spun up to these very short spin periods through accretion of matter and angular momentum from a companion star, right? Um, so their companion evolved to a red giant phase, filled its Roche lobe, and then spun the pulsars up to very, very short spin periods. Um, so most of the pulsars we're observing have white dwarf companions because of this recycling process. So we know of a little over 3,000 pulsars now, um, and of those, a little over 500 are millisecond pulsars. And we roughly categorize millisecond pulsars as periods sort of less than 30 milliseconds. And we need these millisecond pulsars for our experiments. We need to be able to time them very, very precisely to some microsecond precision. And we can only do that with these very fast spinning pulsars. Okay. Um, pulsar video, you always have to show a little pulsar video. Oh, and this. Yeah. So both, 
Um, so part of it is just we need to be able to measure the arrival time at any one epoch to sub-microsecond precision. And we can only do that with a very narrow pulse. And the millisecond pulsars will have much narrower pulses. Um, the other part is they're much cleaner timers. So younger pulsars have glitches. They've got lots of intrinsic spin noise. And these millisecond pulsars are very, very, very stable. Um, they have very small period derivatives. Their slowdown rates are very tiny, right? And they also don't show a lot of intrinsic spin noise. So it's kind of, kind of both. Okay, so the reason this works is that these millisecond pulsars are indeed very, very stable, and we can measure their arrival times to very high precision with radio telescopes. Um, so every time one of these neutron stars spins, this is what we see with our radio telescope. We'll detect a pulse of emission for every rotation of the neutron star. And it's by timing these cosmic you know, ticks uh, that we can search for very tiny perturbations due to gravitational waves. Okay, um, so we're a pulsar timing array experiment. We can't just look at, at one pulsar um, and independently try to detect tiny perturbations in the arrival times of any one pulsar. That could be due to, to anything. We could be mismodeling a particular pulsar. So we need to observe a network of pulsars distributed across the sky and look for correlated perturbations across that whole network due to gravitational waves, right? In order to really show that there's a gravitational wave signal and nothing else. So this is the basic little cartoon of a pulsar timing array. Here's the Earth. Um, we observe pulsars distributed throughout the Milky Way, um, mostly a local population within like a few kiloparsec or a few thousand light years. Um, and each pulsar will have a characteristic pulse shape and period. And so we observe this network of pulsars um, and we look for correlations in the arrival times across this network. Our experiment's a little different than LIGO. So when a gravitational wave passes through LIGO, um, the whole arm is kind of stretched or squeezed. The wavelength is bigger than the size of that four kilometer arm. For our pulsar array, we have many gravitational wave wavelengths in between the earth and the pulsar. So when we model the gravitational wave perturbation, we need to worry about a pulsar term. So what was happening when the pulse like left the pulsar and an earth term to the gravitational wave perturbation. So what's happening when that pulse is received at the earth. So we have these two terms for the perturbation. Um, and we search for like a very specific angular correlation in pulse arrival times predicted by general relativity, right? So we know exactly what we expect in the correlation of all of these arrival times um, if GR is correct. So that's the basic idea of this pulsar timing array experiment. And I'll show you what that correlation, let's see. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> um, so before I get to more of the details about our sensitivity and detection analysis, I'm going to talk a bit about our actual observational program. And then I'll talk about how we actually analyze the data um, and show you our most recent results. Um, so, you know, again, Nanograv is a North American collaboration. Um, so we generally use telescopes in North America. We're currently observing about 70 millisecond pulsars. Um, the two telescopes that we've used for many, many years are the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia. This is the one that's, that's near me. I'm in West Virginia. It has a 100 meter diameter. Um, and the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, which for many years was the largest radio telescope in the world. It has a 300 meter diameter. So our data sets um, have largely been composed of Green Bank and Arecibo data for many years. Um, we now have a small program with the Very Large Array in New Mexico, um, and we've started adding CHIME data. You might have heard about CHIME um, due to the fast radio burst discoveries that it's made. It's been in the news a lot lately for that. So we're now incorporating CHIME data. We also have a very small program with the FAST telescope in China. Um, some of the pulsars that we were observing with Arecibo after it collapsed in August 2020 um, they were just too faint to observe with the GBT, so we're trying to cover some of them with the FAST telescope in China. So we're looking at six pulsars with that telescope. Um, and, and obviously, we still haven't compensated for the loss of Arecibo. Um, Chime is much smaller. The VLA is much smaller. So we really need more collecting area to kind of make up for that sensitivity loss. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned before, the International Pulsar Timing Array um, the goal is to put together data sets from all of the individual regional PTAs. Um, so that program consists of data from a number of radio telescopes all throughout the world. The ones that are in gray um, have been in the last IPTA data release. Um, the ones that are in orange 
our telescopes that are going to be in the next data release, aside from, from FAST. I don't think FAST is going to make it in the data from the Chinese collaboration. Um, but we're adding data from two new telescopes in North America, um, one in Italy, one in South Africa, and of course the GMRT here in India is just going to start adding its data um, to the IPTA data sets for the next release, which is really exciting. Um, this data set is way more sensitive than any of the individual data sets because we can cover more pulsars. We can cover pulsars in the Southern Hemisphere, um, and we just have more pulsars, more time, a higher cadence of observations when we put all this data together. Um, so this should be the most sensitive data set in the world. There's also an IPTA website um, if you want to learn more about IPTA science. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about how pulsar timing works. So in that little like movie that I played you with the spinning pulsar, you could hear every single rotation of the pulsar. In real life, our pulsar data looks like this for most pulsars. Um, the individual pulses are hidden below a lot of noise, and we can only detect the pulses if we sum up many, many pulses at the spin period of the pulsar. So we call this folding. So we take a time series, we add each pulse on top of every other pulse, and then we arrive with like a fairly high signal to noise um, profile that might look something like this. And we measure a time of arrival from that profile at a particular epoch. We then observe that same pulsar, say like a month later, and we have a model, a timing model, that accounts for all the astrophysical things that we know are happening that affect the arrival times. And at this next epoch, we measure another time of arrival, and then we compare it to when our model said the pulse should arrive at that epoch. We subtract the two and we end up with a timing residual. So these timing residuals are the differences between the model predicted and the measured arrival times. And it's these residuals that we search for um, when we look for gravitational waves. We analyze these, th this residual data. Make sense? Okay. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Um, so the way that Nanograv works is we put out data releases like every few years. Um, they're all public. You could go to data.nanograv.org and grab any of these releases. And if you would get one of the releases, um, what you would see is a text file. This is what it looks like um, with lots of numbers here with digits, you know, lots of significant digits. Each one of these numbers is a time of arrival of a pulse on a particular day um, and at a particular radio frequency. These are radio frequencies in megahertz. These are hours and microseconds on the time of arrival. Um, so we make these times of arrival public. Um, we also release all the pulse profiles. So this is a pulse profile for one of our, our brightest millisecond pulsars. Um, you can see how incredibly high signal to noise it is. This is one that um, was observed with Arecibo, so it's very noise free. It's also really bright. And we release what we call PAR files or parameter files. So, this is an example of one of these timing models. Um, and you can see that it includes things like astrometric parameters, like rate ascension and declination, proper motion. Oh no, <laughs> what? I don't know what's going on there. I don't think I am signed in on another device. Um, is it okay? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so we have astrometric parameters like proper motion, um, parallax here, um, right ascension and deck. Obviously, we have to model the spin parameters, so the spin frequency, the frequency derivative. And I'm still amazed after all these years at the precision with which we can measure some of these parameters. So the spin frequency of this pulsar is 218.8118401715795 hertz. And we really do know that down to that last significant digit, which is Pretty impressive, really. Um, this pulsar is in a binary, so we also need to model the binary parameters. It's in a 67-day orbit with a white dwarf star um, with a very well-determined, very small eccentricity. Um, these parameters here, this dispersion measure, DM dot, these are parameters related to delays through the interstellar medium. So for each pulsar, we come up with a timing model that looks like this. It's built up over many years of data, and we can use this to predict when a pulse should arrive at subsequent epochs. And of course, with each new measurement, we're also improving the model and adding any new astrophysical parameters that like, might become important with time, right? Um, okay. I don't really need to keep walking back there, do I? Because this works. Okay. So this is a little schematic just to kind of show like the history of our project and the history of our data releases. Um, so our first data release included five years of data, and we were observing 17 pulsars. So these are pulsar names over here. 
um, year here. The colors are different radio frequency combinations. That doesn't matter too much. Um, our nine-year data set included 37 pulsars. Our 11-year was 45. Our 12-and-a-half-year was 47. This is the one, this 12-and-a-half-year data set is the one I'm going to talk about today. And we're currently working on our 15-year data set, um, which includes 68 pulsars. So we're constantly surveying the sky for new millisecond pulsars that we can add to this array to continue to grow the array. And as we grow the array, we become more and more sensitive to gravitational waves. Um, don't need to do that. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you look at this time span here, we've been observing for about 15 years. And what that means is we're sensitive to very low frequency gravitational waves. So unlike LIGO, we analyze the entire time span of our experiment in one go, right? So we're looking at 15 year now time slices of data. And so our peak sensitivity is going to be at one over that total time span, right? So we're most sensitive to gravitational waves with frequencies of about one over 15 years, which is like 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus nine hertz. And so this plot shows gravitational wave strain on this axis and gravitational wave frequency on this axis. And these are some sensitivity curves for nanograv a few years ago, nanograv by 2030. And um, you can see they have this V shape and you can see that the peak sensitivity is shifting to the left with time as our data set gets longer and longer and longer. That's really good news because we think that the stochastic background is getting stronger and stronger and stronger as we go to low frequencies. So we gain sensitivity in kind of two ways. We're getting more sensitive as our experiment gets longer, but also the background is getting stronger at these lower frequencies. So that's really great. Um, we're not sensitive at this frequency right here. Anyone have a guess what that is? So this is one over a year. Um, and we're not sensitive at exactly one over a year because we would fit that out when we fit for these other yearly dependent effects, like the Earth's motion around the sun. We need to correct for that. Um, yeah, so um, you'll notice here that our strain sensitivity um, is not nearly as good as LIGO. So LIGO is down here at like, you know, 10 to the minus 22, something like that. And we're at 10 to the minus 15 or so. Um, that is okay. This goes back to your question because these supermassive black hole binaries are predicted to have these really enormous strains. So there are many sources for us to detect. And if you're wondering where this 10 to the minus 15 comes from, a nice way to think about this is it's going to be approximately the like precision of our timing, which is about you know, a couple hundred nanoseconds for most of the pulsars over the time span of the experiment, about 15 years. So that's where that 10 to the minus 15 roughly comes from. Um, yeah, so we sample a completely different frequency range than LIGO, so very complementary to LIGO. Um, completely different source classes. There's really no overlap between the binaries that we will observe and the binaries that LIGO observes, like vastly different size scales and mass scales. There might be a little bit of overlap um, with LISA, which will kind of bridge the gap between uh, LIGO and Nanograv. Maybe a little bit, we'll see. Okay, so let me just show you a little bit of like what our actual residual data looks like. So again, these residuals are the differences between when our model predicts a pulse should arrive at any epoch, and our epochs are here, this is time on this axis, um, minus when that pulse actually arrived. And I just picked kind of three random pulsars to show you here. Um, again, the colors are different radio frequencies. We have to observe at multiple radio frequencies to correct for inter interstellar medium effects that are radio frequency dependent. Um, so if you look at these, they're really messy, right? Um, most of the points are centered on zero, the error bars cross zero, which is good. That means that our model is doing a good job. You can also see, though, that there are many points that aren't. Um, you know, this guy is, is really far off. This guy is way up here. So there are points that actually don't agree with the model either. Some of these we can explain. Um, some of them we think might be due to interstellar medium effects that we're not, like, quite correcting for. Some of them we can't. Um, we don't know what they are. But our analysis relies on cross-correlating the signals from many different pulsars, right? And so this might decrease our overall sensitivity, um, but if this is a gravitational wave perturbation, we will see it in all of the pulsar data when we cross-correlate it. Um, these lines here, these dotted lines, if you're curious about them, this is when we like upgraded instrumentation at the telescopes. We went to wider radio bandwidths. So the error bars get a little bit smaller um, after these dotted lines. And there's two here, because this pulsar we're observing with both Arecibo and the GBT. So we had an Arecibo upgrade and a, a GBT upgrade. And these two we just observed with one telescope. 
Um, another thing you might notice is that the cadence of the points has got um, much smaller with time. This is just due to us getting money to purchase time on the telescope so we could get a lot more observing time and observe like every week versus every month. Any questions about this before I move on? Oh yeah, the thing at the bottom, let me just mention that. Um, when we talk about like how good a pulsar is for timing, we generally quantify it by the root mean square of the residuals. Um, and so for the pulsars in our nanograv data set, it ranges from like 60 nanoseconds um, to about a microsecond or so. So that's sort of the level um, of precision with which we can model and measure these pulse arrival times. Yeah. These outliers, kind of all telescopes. Yeah, so we don't know. Yeah, so obviously we spend a lot of time doing outlier analysis before we even get to this stage. So there's lots of outliers that have been removed. So if there's something, you know, sometimes there's really bad radio frequency interference on a particular day, we zap it because we know what it's from and we say we're not going to include that. Um, sometimes there's an outlier due to like some kind of error with the back end or some data recording thing, we zap that. So the only things that are left here are things that we just really can't explain. Some of them could be interesting. There could be really cool astrophysics. You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe some delay is due to a pulse, you know, experiencing a, a Shapiro delay traveling past a primordial black hole or something. There could be really cool stuff in here. Um, but for the gravitational wave analysis we're doing, we just rely on the cross correlations and we're not really worrying about what's happening in any one pulsar. Yeah, so a stochastic, I'm going to, I think I'm going to answer it in the next slide. I'll show you kind of what it looks like in timing residuals. And then maybe you can ask me if it's, you still have a question. Yeah. Any direction at all, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so we have pulsars, you know, all across the sky. Um, and then I think I'm gonna answer this in a minute too. So just like, just hold on. Is, is there another question? Yeah, so, so we're timing 70 of these pulsars with nanograv. So we cross correlate each one of those 70 pulsars with every other one of those pulsars. I think I'm going to answer all these questions. So I'm going to show you the curve, the Hellings and Downs curve, this famous correlation that we're looking for in the data, I think in the next slide, or very soon. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, um, so, so I'm going to show this first, and then I'll show the Hellings and Downs curve. I kind of like mixed up the way I arranged this talk, thinking I'll like give the big picture and then show that correlation curve. I think maybe I should show it sooner because I think there's too much suspense. <laughs> Might be better to show it earlier. Anyway, before I do that, though, I just want to show a little bit more data. Um, so these are some timing residuals for the International Pulsar Timing Array. Um, and I don't have time to go into these in, in any amount of detail, but the International Pulsar Timing Array data release, um, we've only done two, so fewer than nanograv because it takes a lot longer to combine all the data from all these telescopes. That has 65 millisecond pulsars. Um, these are some of the residual plots. Um, this is decades worth of data here, about 20 years of data. Um, there's lots of different looks to these residuals, right? So some of them um, are very flat. They have really small error bars. The different colors are different telescopes. Um, some of them show a lot of structure. So you can see some very like kind of red noise-like structure in this one and this one. And we do the same process with the IPTA data. We cross-correlate each of these residuals with the residuals of every other pulsar to look for this very special angular correlation signature. Um, the IPTA data, the residuals range from something like 200 nanoseconds to 10 microseconds. It's a little bit worse because lots of systematics creep in when you try to combine data from all of these telescopes. It's kind of a, uh, it's a difficult job. Okay. Yeah, so this is what we're looking for. I think this will answer some questions. Um, so this Hellings and Downs curve was published back in 1983. Um, and this describes the correlation you expect in times of arrival versus the angular separation between pulsars for a stochastic background of gravitational waves, assuming a uniform source distribution, um, and assuming, of course, that general relativity is correct. And in that case, we expect sources that are in the same direction of the sky that are separated by zero degrees to show a positive correlation. So if a pulse from a pulsar in that direction arrives early, a pulse from another pulsar in that same direction should also arrive early. At 90 degrees, because of this quadrupolar nature of gravitational waves, we expect an anti-correlation. And then back at 180 degrees, we expect a positive correlation again. Um, you'll see this isn't exactly at 90. Um, 
but this is what you get when you do the math, right? Integrating over this isotropic distribution of sources. Um, you'll see the correlation here only goes up to 0.5. It's not perfect. And that's because these pulsar terms are all uncorrelated. All the pulsars are at different di distances. So for this stochastic background, that's just like a noise source. So what we're really seeing when we look for this correlation is just the effect of gravitational waves on the Earth itself, right? So when we make a detection, we're detecting the effect on the Earth itself, not on the pulsars. Those are just noise sources for this stochastic background search. Is it clear? Yeah, okay, so this is the very um, special signature we're looking for in our data. And this is really unique to gravitational waves, this quadrupolar type signature. Um, if we detect this in our data, it's very difficult to come up with any other source of noise or systematics that could produce this exact kind of correlation in our data. So these plots show what a gravitational wave will look like in pulsar timing residuals. So let's start with this one. So this is what a stochastic background would look like in our pulsar timing residual. So the stochastic background has lots of power at very low frequencies. So it would look like a very kind of long time scale variation. The three different colors are just three different pulsars in different directions of the sky. It'll look different depending on where the pulsar is located. This bottom plot though shows what this will look like once we fit our timing model, right? So we don't know the properties of the stochastic background. So when we fit for things like period derivative, parallax proper motion, this is gonna get absorbed into those timing model parameters. And then we'll be left with something that looks kind of like this, right? So what's left behind will be this kind of like low frequency kind of red noise like structure. Makes sense. Um, this upper plot here shows what a single gravitational wave source would look like in our timing residuals. So if we have just one supermassive black hole binary, um, then we would get kind of sinusoidal perturbations like this. Again, the three different colors are three different pulsars in different directions. So depending on the angle of the pulsar, the source, and the Earth, we're going to have a different amplitude and phase. And this is what those would look like after fitting the timing model, assuming the gravitational wave source doesn't have a period of like a year or the same period of a binary orbit. This is going to be preserved, right? This is not going to get absorbed into our timing parameters unless we're unlucky and they happen to have like these, the same characteristic frequency. The period of the, the frequency of this is going to be um, twice that of the gravitational wave source, yeah. And you'll notice that they just look like, um, generally like sine waves, um, because our sources are still pretty far from merger. We don't really, we don't assume much evolution over the 15 year time span of our data. So we're looking for non-involving um, circular orbit sources, which will just look like sine waves in our pulsar timing residuals. For now, eventually we might get more sophisticated and look for eccentric things or evolving things. But for now, we're just looking for this like kind of simplest scenario. Yeah. Yeah, so those are for three different pulsars. Why do they look similar over here and not over here? Like these two ones, looks, these two here look similar. Um, that's a good question. I don't actually remember, this is not my paper. Um, yeah, I'm not actually sure why these look so similar and this doesn't. I think it's probably like a pulsar term, earth term thing. So we're more sensitive to the location of a gravitational wave source for these single sources than we are for the stochastic background? That's a really good question, actually. I'm not sure why these look so very similar here and this looks so different and not on that, that side. I'm actually not sure. I'll look into it. It's a really good question. You mean this curve here? Um, yeah, so with time, this is continuing to, I mean, this, this will continue to grow in amplitude. It's, it shouldn't be, a, it's not a completely straight line. These ones here. Yeah, and with time, that will grow. I think the, the issue is the power is at very, very low frequencies that are like, like the time, the characteristic time scale is much, much larger than this small 15 years of our data set. But if you plotted this 
for longer time scales, you would, you would see this signature growing and growing. Yeah. Those are good questions. <coughs> Um, no, they're not actually dependent on it, but they will change if there's a background because we'll inadvertently absorb some of that background into those model parameters. So can I ask a question? So we kind of do. So I'm kind of simplifying things here a little bit. So the question is, do our timing model parameters actually depend on the background itself? So what we actually do is we fit for this timing model you know, like something like this, whoops, <laughs> right? So we fit for all these parameters and then we do our gravitational wave background search. And when we do that, we actually allow those timing model parameters to also vary a little bit. So we do it simultaneously. So we'll kind of fit for an initial timing model. And then when we search for the gravitational waves, we'll also allow those timing parameters to be perturbed a little bit um, to try to avoid like absorbing a lot of the background into the um, timing models. So if there's some like common signature among all the pulsars, hopefully when we do that second fit, we'll identify that common bit and kind of like take that out of the timing model parameter fit. Oh, sorry. Should... Yeah, is there a Zoom question? Hello, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. Sorry that I, uh, I didn't quite hear you before. So if you regard the entire collection of pulsars as providing a kind of clock at the Earth's location because of their pulses, can, I, uh, can you tell me what would be the accuracy of such a clock? Yeah, so some people are using um, our pulsar timing array exactly for that, like for a, a time standard outside of sort of, you know, GPS or atomic clocks. Um, the accuracy ideally could be sort of a few to 10 nanoseconds, something like that. Okay, thank you, thank you, yeah. yeah it's not quite as good um, as atomic clocks, but it's continuing to get better with time. Okay. That was my question, yes. Okay, so before I talk about the gravitational wave analysis, um, I just wanna point out that things are definitely more complex than just in the timing model I showed you. So that timing model fits for all the deterministic stuff, right? All the stuff that we know exactly what the signature should look like in the residuals. But there are other sources of noise that aren't deterministic. So pulsars aren't perfect rotators. They have some like spin irregularities. Um, there's also pulse jitter. This means that the single pulses don't all have exactly the same phase. They kind of like jump around. Um, these are intrinsic to the pulsar. There's some things that are extrinsic to the pulsar. So scattering and dispersion measure from the interstellar medium. Um, we need to correct our times of arrival for travel through the solar system, for the Earth's motion around the sun, for all the gravitational tugs of the planets. There might be uncertainties in those ephemerides. We could have like even clock errors in the clocks that we use to time tag our pulses. But the important thing is that all of these have different signatures. So we Fourier transform our residuals and all of these will have like a slightly different spectral signature. Um, some of them depend on radio frequency in different ways. Um, and so we can fit for all these independently. And the very important thing is that only one of these other sources of noise should show any spatial correlation. That would be an error in a planetary ephemeris, right? So if we had um, the mass of Jupiter wrong, we would expect to also see a correlation for pulsars separated by zero degrees in the same direction. But the anti-correlation would be at 180 degrees, not 90, right? So that's how we discriminate that. So gravitational waves are the only thing that show these quadrupolar spatial correlations. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the results of our analysis. Um, I'd like to go back. So our current data set is the 12 and a half year. And I, that seems kind of silly. It was just the natural place to, to break it off, not in an integer year. But so our current data set is the 12 and a half year. Um, I'm gonna show you the one before that, the 11 year data set, just cause it's kind of a nice story. Um, so our 11 year data set was published, um, I guess like four years ago now. Um, and when we first analyzed, this 11 years of data, we were very, very, very excited. And the reason for that is that we do this analysis. And the first thing we look for before we even search for these angular correlations, it's just a common noise source among all the pulsars. So is there a common spectral signature with the same amplitude and spectrum 
that we see in like all of the pulsar residuals, right? So we look for this common noise first. And when we did that, these dotted curves are what we found. So this is the probability density versus gravitational wave amplitude. Um, we calculated this blue curve here. Um, and there was a peak at a particular gravitational wave amplitude, like 10 to the minus 15. It was a pretty significant peak. And so this told us that there was some common source of noise among all the pulsars. For about a month or two, we really thought we detected gravitational waves. We were really excited. We kind of got ahead of ourselves, like, this is so great. How are we going to make this announcement and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then, and we hadn't seen the spatial correlations yet. So it wasn't like, you know, a done deal, but we, we thought we were on the way, right? Um, and then we said, you know what, we better try to make this thing go away. <laughs> like, let's try everything we can to make it go away. And the one thing we did is we tried different planetary ephemerides. Um, so these DE things here are different JPL ephemerides. Um, so we tried this one and we got a different answer. We tried this one, we got a different answer. Um, we tried this one, we got an even different answer. So depending on what ephemeris we use, um, we got a different shape to this probability density function. And that was very worrying. Um, and then what we realized was that the solar system ephemerides we were using from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory actually weren't accurate enough for our purposes. Um, so they just didn't determine the positions of the planets to enough accuracy for what, what we needed. Um, so for instance, like Jupiter, they need to know the position to say like 100 meters. And um, we need better than that, right? We get to a level of accuracy we needed at sort of like, you know, 10 meters. Anyway, so we developed a new code that would fit for these ephemeris errors basically a dipolar correlation. At the same time as we search for gravitational waves, this quadrupolar correlation, and then these solid curves are what we got after we, we fit for those ephemeris errors. And so now, regardless of which one we start with, we get the same answer. Unfortunately, that answer looks like an upper limit, not a detection, right? So this wasn't a detection of gravitational waves, but it was kind of nice because we developed this new code. Obviously, that's important. And it also gave us like kind of a trial run um, for detection because we kind of thought we had something in our data and we got good practice at trying to like tease out what that was. And so even though we didn't make a detection with that data, it was sensitive enough that we could place interesting astrophysical constraints. So there's lots of models um, for black hole mass versus galactic bulge mass, right? And some of them predict larger black holes, some of them predict smaller black holes. And given our result, we could actually rule out or at least disfavor um, some of the models that predicted large black holes, because if the black hole masses were really this large, we should have seen something in our data already, right? So in the 11 year, we were already at a level where we should have seen something given the most like optimistic models for black hole to bulge mass. So that was quite exciting. And we came into our next analysis, our 12 and a half year, um, thinking that we do the same thing. We thought, oh, well, we'll get a better upper limit with the 12 and a half year we'll be able to set even more exciting astrophysical constraints. But that didn't happen because in the 12 and a half year, we have a very clear detection of a common noise process that we cannot make go away no matter what we do, right? So this paper was published a couple years ago. This is the same plot. So probability density versus gravitational wave amplitude. You see a few different curves here. Um, the solid curve is what we get for a fixed solar system ephemeris. So now there's a new ephemeris from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which um, includes data from Juno. So this is this new satellite that's orbiting Jupiter. Um, it's good enough now. We don't need to do that base FM process. This is a French group, um, a French ephemeris. Um, and these are the, the curves that we get, these dotted curves, when we do our Bayesian um, you know, marginalization over the ephemeris errors. So in either case, no matter what we do, we see a very clear peak here. Um, and so what this means is that there's a common noise source among all the pulsars in our data that we cannot make go away. So that's very exciting. Um, it's consistent with gravitational waves, but we can't yet say it is gravitational waves for sure. And the reason for that, of course, is this. <laughs> um, so this is the plot of the correlated power versus angular separation. These black points are the data. Um, and of course, we've binned them just for ease of viewing, right? So, so these are bin data points. We can't show every single uh, pairwise correlation. Um, but you can see looking at this that they do not hug this Hellings and Downs curve. So this blue dotted line is our best fit Hellings and Downs curve to these black points. Um, the error bars are smaller than the 11 year. You can kind of, you know, we look at this and kind of you know, oh, I think these might be kind of hugging the curve, but they're clearly outliers. No one would look at this and say that by eye, 
this is a detection. So we have not yet detected the angular correlations, just this common source of noise. Yeah. What are the parameters? What do we fit? Yeah, I mean, we're fitting. So this shape, um, th this exact shape, we don't, you know, we just assume the shape is, is this shape. And the only thing we're really fitting is the amplitude. So we just shift this like up and down, basically. So we're just fitting for, for an amplitude and we don't allow anything else to vary. In time we will, um, because this will vary um, depending on like the anisotropy, an anisotropy of the source population and all sorts of other things in the spectrum. But for now, we're just fitting this exact thing. Okay. Um, and that monopole line is just there to show what happens if we fit um, a monopole. So there is some power. So this is above zero. There's clearly, clearly power there. Um, but we can't yet, in this data set at least, distinguish between this quadrupolar signature and a monopolar signature. So no, you know, no variation with angular separation. Yeah. Is there a question? This one is from 47 pulsars. Yeah. I'm going to get to that in just like <laughs> two slides, I think. Yeah, you've set me up. <laughs> just, just give me like two slides. Um, yeah, so one thing we can do is look at this spectrum of this background. Um, and so this plot here shows the spectrum versus gravitational wave frequency. And these gray bands here um, show this spectrum of that gravitational wave background. You can see it's a really red spectrum, like with lots of power at low frequencies. Um, and we can fit this spectrum. Um, this is a, a power law fit to the lowest frequencies. Um, this is a broken power law fit. They both look really consistent. Um, this is not a good fit because it's dominated by all this white noise at high frequencies. But this, these sh this shows the contours of our fit to the spectrum versus the amplitude and the spectral index. Um, this dotted line here shows the spectral index we expect for a population of supermassive black hole binaries under the very simplest astrophysical assumption, which is that their mergers are purely driven by gravitational waves. And the nice thing is that our constraints on the spectrum are roughly consistent with that prediction, right? So this is really nice. Um, it gives us more confidence that what we are seeing could indeed be an astrophysical gravitational wave background. And it is seen in data, independent data sets from other pulsar timing arrays. I think this gets to your question. So um, it's seen in the PPTA collaboration. This is the Parkes pulsar timing array. They use the Parkes telescope in Australia. So after we published our data set, um, then uh, this collaboration published their results with a very similar spectral index and very similar amplitude. So the same spectral index and amplitude. It's seen in the EPTA. This is the European collaboration. Again, completely consistent spectral index and amplitude. And we've also recently put together a combined data set, an IPTA data set, just this past year. We see the same thing. Um, we see a consistent spectral index and amplitude among all of these data sets. Um, they're not completely independent. So all of the data sets have some pulsars in common, um, but they're completely independent telescopes. Um, data analysis to some extent is different. Um, and so this is very, very reassuring. We see the same thing in all of these data sets, the same common noise process. But in none of the data sets, even this IPT data set, do we see this telltale angular correlation. But that is next. <laughs> um, so of course the question is when will this common noise become an actual you know gravitational wave signal that we can we can say for sure is due to an astrophysical background? So we've done simulations, of course, where we you know build our data set out, assuming that what we're seeing in the 12 and a half year is indeed gravitational waves. And our next data set, which is 15 years of data, um, we should see this signal with a signal to noise of something like four to seven, um, something of that order. And when I say this signal, I mean the spatial correlations. This is not real data. This is a projection of what we might expect to see in the 15-year data set. And you can see looking at this that you can clearly see um, this correlation by eye. 
right? It's not, not super high signal to noise, but you can look at this and see that these are beginning to hug the curve. Um, so this is a, a simulation of what we might expect to see in our 15-year data set. So this is very exciting. Um, we're publishing this data set within the next like few months. It's, it's, it's really, really close. I can't talk about it yet, um, but you know, we, we, we're um, working really hard to get this out soon. The 15 years? So the 15 year data set has 68 pulsars. So quite a bit more than the 47 we had in the last data set. So it's a pretty significant sensitivity improvement when we add like that other two and a half years plus all those pulsars. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, so it's expected for any isotropic source of gravitational waves, not necessarily only supermassive black hole binaries though. And in fact, our results, you know, the spectral results that I showed you, they're also consistent with a background due to cosmic strings. Um, so we expect cosmic strings um, to vibrate and produce gravitational waves um, in a very similar frequency range and, and with a similar red spectrum actually. Um, we also expect we might be able to detect a background due to primordial gravitational waves um, from the Big Bang. And that also has a similar predicted spectrum, like also a red spectrum like this. So in our first detection, if it looks something like this, um, we will probably only constrain the spectrum to something like the spectral index to something like 50%. So we will not be able to say with this first detection, if it indeed is in our 15 year, whether it's for sure supermassive black hole binaries, cosmic strings or primordial gravitational waves. It'll only be like a few years in that we'll be able to discriminate those. Well, so all, all of the different um, sources have different predictions for the spectrum. So, so with time, even without detecting a single source, like just from the stochastic background me measurements, we should be able to discriminate between supermassive black hole binaries and these other sources. Um, and the, the, obviously there's more than one, right? So we expect that this background um, has contributions from maybe all three of these sources. Yeah, and a, a grad student of mine has been working on like when we'll be able to disentangle like multiple source populations and maybe in like our 20 year data set, if we have two sources, two background sources that are kind of equal amplitude, you know, so maybe five years from now, we'll be able to discriminate those two different spectral slopes, but it'll take a bit of time. The reason we focus on the supermassive black hole binaries is just they're more like a sure thing. Like there, there are more models um, that we trust to predict an amplitude and the predicted amplitude is higher in general than the predicted amplitudes for the other source populations. So we're more focused on the supermassive black hole binaries. We might be surprised though, <laughs> who knows? Okay. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the continuous wave results. Um, so continuous waves are, you know, single sources. So single supermassive black hole binaries. Um, so we also set sky dependent limits on single sources of gravitational waves. So this plot here shows the distance in megaparsecs to which we could detect a single supermassive black hole binary in the 11 year data set. Um, we assume a billion solar mass binary um, at sort of our most sensitive frequency, um, we're getting out to like, you know, 100 megaparsecs or so. Um, what you'll see is this is really anisotropic. We have a lot of sensitivity in one part of the sky. These stars are our pulsars because we have most of our pulsars in that part of the sky. And we have very little sensitivity in other parts of the sky because we have very few pulsars. So one thing we want to do going forward is really like even out this pulsar distribution. We need to find more pulsars over here. These diamonds are electromagnetically identified candidates. So supermassive black hole binary candidates identified through electromagnetic observations. Unfortunately, most of them sit in the part of the sky where we have very little sensitivity, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, we can also set like sky average limits. So these curves here show the sky average limits for our five-year, nine-year, 11-year data set. Um, and you can see we're getting better with time. Um, the peak is shifting to the left. We have this you know, lack of sensitivity at one over a year. Um, and we can make like interesting constraints. Um, for instance, we can say, 
you know, in the Virgo cluster, there are no supermassive black hole binaries with masses greater than about a billion solar masses. Um, so if the EHT black hole was a binary, we would have seen it in our data. So that's exciting. We're getting into sort of real astrophysical territory. You might be wondering why I'm showing the 11 year and not the 12 and a half year. And that's because it's not quite done yet. Um, the paper is submitted. <laughs> um, it's, it's very close to being out, but obviously we haven't made a detection. Um, we have better limits, you know, but okay. Um, another th thing that we've done lately is carried out targeted gravitational wave searches. So instead of just searching the sky blindly for single sources, if someone gives us an electromagnetic candidate like this galaxy 3C66b um, that they think has a supermassive black hole binary at the core, and they tell us we think the orbital period is about this and the mass is about that, then we can do a search over a much narrower range of parameters, which makes us more sensitive, right? So we can start with those priors and then search around those priors. And so we did this recently for this 3C66b, um, which is purported to have a billion solar mass black hole at its core. It's fairly nearby. And when we do that, um, this blue histogram here shows the posterior distribution we calculate on the mass. Um, this is in billions of solar mass. And here's our 95% confidence upper limit. Um, this orange region here is the observationally predicted mass. Um, with this orange dotted line, the, uh, the the median of that. And you can see we're pretty close, actually. So like we're within a factor of, of a couple of actually being able to detect this binary. So that, that's really exciting. So in a few years, we should either make a detection of this or we should rule out the published mass estimate. I'm hoping for the former, but <laughs> the latter would be interesting as well. Okay, so finally, let me just talk a little bit about what we're doing going forward, what our goals are to increase our sensitivity. Um, the first thing that we really want to do is we want to grow the number of millisecond pulsars in the array. We'd like to get to something like 200 millisecond pulsars by, say, 2030. Um, and one, one thing I just want to highlight is we have a lot of students, including some high school students in India, who are helping do this. We have a program. It's pulsars.nagra.org if you have a, a favorite high school student that you want to recommend it to, um, where students can get trained in how to look for pulsars and data with the Green Bank Telescope. Um, we have in-person camps. That's a little hard for students from India, um, but people can participate from anywhere in the world and they can learn how to look at pulsar data. And they found eight new pulsars so far, which is really exciting. Um, so we're focusing pretty hard on, on just detecting more pulsars, especially in those like empty regions of the sky to even out our sensitivity. Um, one other thing that's pretty exciting for us is there's a new receiver on the Green Bank Telescope. So currently we have to observe at like two separate frequencies. Um, those are those different colors in the plots, and we need to do that to correct for interstellar medium effects. And it's kind of inefficient, um, and the bands aren't that big. Our bands cover like this region here and this region here, and that's it. Um, there's a new receiver on the GBT. It's covering like a much wider radio frequency range, um, and this is going to be really awesome for us. It's going to increase our sensitivity a lot, and we're not going to need to do those separate observing sessions. So we can add more pulsars, we can integrate for longer, we, we can increase the cadence. So this is really great. This thing is built. Um, it's being commissioned. The Green Bank Telescope is actually broken right now. So we've got a it's very frustrating. We're just about to start using this thing. And then there's a problem with the track. So anyway, we'll be using this hopefully within like a few months. Um, another thing that we're working on right now is incorporating data from this Canadian CHIME telescope into our data set. So the CHIME telescope is a transit telescope. It doesn't move. It just sits there. Pulsars drift overhead. Um, the integration times are shorter. So it's not quite as sensitive as Green Bank, but it will observe our pulsars every single day. So we're getting daily cadence observations of most of our pulsars with CHIME, which is going to be totally amazing. Um, it's not still clear like quite what the improvement will be because we haven't integrated that data fully into our data set, but this is really exciting. It also observes at a much lower frequency. Um, it observes at 400 to 800 megahertz and the GBT is higher. This will be really helpful for tracking these interstellar medium effects. And I haven't talked much about them. That's like a whole other talk, but this wide frequency range will be really helpful to beating down this one source of noise in our data. And finally, um, we really need a new telescope. Um, so our sensitivity took a big hit with the loss of Arecibo. Um, and just to be clear, this 15 year data set, the one that we're publishing really soon, we stopped that the day Arecibo collapsed. <laughs> so that was like the natural end of that data set. So the 15 year data set includes all the data up until the day that we could no longer observe with Arecibo, um, which actually wasn't the collapse. It was a few months 
before the collapse because um, it was already very unsteady. But anyway, we need a new telescope. So right now we're not nearly as sensitive as we were. Um, the kind of things we're looking at are telescopes like this. This is a, a telescope called the DSA 2000. Um, it's 2000 small dishes. It would have a very wide field of view. Um, we would get hopefully on this telescope about 25% of the time. It's not funded yet. We're really hoping this gets built. It would be out in Nevada, um, somewhere in the, you know, the Western part of America where there's not a lot of radio frequency interference. And the reason we need more sensitivity is that if we want to detect single sources, right, our goal is to start building up like a gravitational wave catalog of supermassive black hole binaries. Um, this band here shows the predicted strains for single gravitational wave sources for a population of supermassive black hole binaries. Um, this green curve is where we will be in 10 years without this telescope. This blue curve is where we will be in 10 years with this telescope. And we're gonna be detecting many, many more of these single sources if we have the sensitivity of DSA 2000. So this is really, really important for fully characterizing the low frequency gravitational wave universe. Um, and another huge focus right now is completing the next IPTA data release. So you might wonder why I'm just talking about nanograv results and nanograv projections. And the reason for that is that the IPTA data release is a little bit behind the nanograv release. It just takes a really long time to combine data from all of these telescopes. But of course, this will be much more sensitive. So the next data release will be even more sensitive than this nanograv 15-year data. If the nanograv 15-year has a tentative detection of these angular correlations, they should be much stronger in the IPTA release. Um, and this IPTA release, the next one, should be very sensitive for single source searches. So this plot shows strain versus frequency again. Um, these dots are predicted strains and frequencies um, for a simulated population of supermassive black hole binaries. If you look closely, there's five different colors. There's five, so there's five different populations here. And these are predicted sensitivities for the IPTA in 2025, 2030, and 2035. And you can see that even in 2025, there are a few sources um, popping out above um, the sensitivity curve. This is 3C66B right here. Um, so it should definitely be detectable in 2025 in this IPTA data, which is, which is really, really exciting. Um, so we're really moving into a regime of true like multi-messenger astrophysics. We also want to expand the network, add new telescopes, hopefully get fast in China on board. This is the largest telescope in the world. It'd be really nice if they would want to join the effort. Um, and yeah, so, so the goal is, you know, ultimately to detect single sources of supermassive black hole binaries, um, both with our pulsar timing array and then with telescopes all over the electromagnetic spectrum, all over the globe, um, to really get into the era of multi-messenger, low-frequency gravitational wave astrophysics. We have a new website. This illustrator has made all these like really cool illustrations for us. So this is mostly just to show off this really, really nice and nice illustration, um, which is not completely scientific and physical, but it's like, it's cool. It's pretty. Okay. So I think I'll just leave this up because it's quite late and I'm happy to take any questions either now or hang out after and chat to people. Yeah, I mean, I mean, none of this really depends on anything like intrinsic to the pulsar. We're, we really are just treating them as um, clocks, as, as, as just tools in space. So, um, yeah, atomic clocks are a little more stable than pulsars at the moment. The only reason that we can reach, reach the levels of atomic clocks with pulsars is like by using them as an array, but an individual atomic clock um, yeah, is, is more stable than a pulsar. Yeah, I mean, people have talked about um, like kind of uh, putting something like a pulsar on the moon, like an artificial pulsar or something um, to be sensitive to gravitational wave frequencies, like kind of, uh, you know, lower than LIGO, but, you know, not nanohertz. There's all sorts of fantastic things you could think about with the same concept. You just need something that you can time. <laughs> Uh, you give us this uh, nice physical picture, if I've understood it right, that you have these gravitational waves coming from all these sources, but what you actually look for is the Earth term, right? Yes, yeah. So the Earth is shaking. The others are shaking, yep. but they're that—that's noise, right? Yep, that's correct. Now, yeah. um, 
you're looking for angular correlations. So if I have got the picture right, you're assuming that the earth has gone through many cycles of its shaking during your data length. Yes, yeah. But as you go to earth, so uh, if you have only say one cycle in your data length, then it's deterministic, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, earth doesn't have, yeah. it's not. So then you should not see it in correlations. You would actually see it as a pattern, no? as an angular pattern. If I go through just one cycle. Oh, right. But I don't know whether, of course, your, your sensitivity goes down perhaps at that low end. But I was just thinking, why look just for correlations? Why not look for a, in some sense, it's like a directed pattern, right? I mean, I, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think, I think what you're saying is what we're doing when we search for like single sources more. I'm saying even the stochastic things. Yeah, but it's going to have power. Single source. At, yeah. Well, it's going to have power at many, many, many frequencies. So we're more sensitive if we search for this like overall correlation rather than just picking out any like one specific I was just thinking at the frequency. Low, low frequency end. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, are there any last questions? If not, let's thank. Oh. Ashut, go ahead. Uh, hi, hopefully I'm audible. Just a, a couple of quick questions. Um, the first is what kind of localization ability does pulsar timing have and how does that improve with the number of pulsars in a pulsar timing array? And uh, my second question is for the individual sources, at what stage of the SMBH binary in spiral do you expect to actually detect the gravitational waves? Is it a few cycles before merger or is it early in the in spiral? Yeah, those are both really good questions. Um, so as far as localization goes, for the single sources, um, when we, so I think our first detection will probably be follow-up of an electromagnetic source that's already been localized. So probably our first detections will look like that because we're much more sensitive. Um, but if we detect something blindly, we have very, very poor localization um, if we're just using the Earth term. So it's kind of like analogous with LIGO. You need multiple right, LIGO, Virgo stations in order to triangulate and localize well. If we only use the Earth term, we're going to have very poor localization, like, you know, quarter of the sky or half the sky, something like that. And the reason for that is that we don't know the distances to the pulsars well enough yet to use the pulsar terms, even for the single source searches. Um, that's getting better with time, though. So we can measure the distances with parallax. Those parallax measurements are getting more and more precise. So maybe in a decade, we'll be able to use more of those pulsar terms, um, and then we'll be able to do much better localization. Um, and indeed, it will improve very dramatically with the number of pulsars. So the more pulsars we have, the, the better we can localize, just like the more LIGO or Virgo detectors there are, you know, localization improves dramatically. So it's the same concept, but we need to know the positions to the pulsars much better than we do right now. Um, the second, hopefully they answered the first question. Um, the second question is completely escaping my mind, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, so we're still very far from merger. So these binaries um, have subparsec separation, um, but they're still maybe a million years from, from when they actually emerge. So we're still very, very far from merger. Thank you very much. Okay, go on. No, no, I just wanted to thank her. Thank you. I mean, I'll take the last question. Yeah, sure. uh, so the, the plot issue of the predicted uh, amplitude of the, yeah. the non-sources, um, how how did they compute the predicted uh, amplitude? Because this, uh, other uh, binary uh, AGNs observe... Is this this plot here? Subparsec? This one here? Yeah, this one. Yeah, so this is taking a two-mass catalog of galaxies. Um, so it's assuming some redshift distribution of galaxies. Um, some mass distribution. Those things are known pretty well. The thing that's not known very well is the pair fraction. So what fraction of those galaxies have a supermassive black hole binary at the core? They assume some reasonable pair fraction based on, um, you know, merger history um, arguments. But that's, that's the uncertain thing. So there's like, this is made from real data, um, but there are lots of assumptions that go into it. And in particular, the big one is like the pair fraction. So the 3C6X6B, do we know their separations, that subparsec separation? 
Uh, we, we have a pretty good handle on them. So from radio observations with the very large array, um, they model this binary and measure an orbital period, um, which is very close to a year, actually, which made us a bit suspicious at first, but it's not, not quite a year, um, and an orbital separation. So they have a, a pretty good handle observationally. Of course, it's model dependent, right? It could be wrong. Um, and they've already come up. It's an interesting story. The first paper they published had much larger masses. And then we ruled that out. And then they came out with a new paper, which is like, oh, no, no, it's actually a little bit less. You know, so that illustrates that, you know, all these things need to be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt. And it's not until we actually make that first detection that, that we'll kind of know, like, where this population lies. Okay, thank you very much. Very... Yes, one more. Okay, last, last question. Yeah, 13 thirds is the spectral index we expect. That is just for a supermassive black hole binary background. So that is what you get if you assume you have a supermassive background, um, a supermassive black hole binary, ugh, sorry, <laughs> um, which is merging purely due to gravitational wave emission. So gravitational waves are the only thing bringing it together. That is what you get. There are different predictions for other backgrounds, um, like cosmic strings. Um, primordial gravitational waves. And in fact, we don't think gravitational waves are the only thing that's bringing them together. So we don't expect this background to even have exactly 13 thirds. That would be very boring, actually. Like we'd like to see a slightly different spectral index because that's how we'll get astrophysics out. Yeah. Yeah. Do you mean due to different sources, like source contributions? Yeah, I don't, we can't distinguish it now because all of these backgrounds, the spectral indices are like minus three to minus five or so, and we can only determine it to maybe 50%. So, so right now we wouldn't be able to distinguish those, um, but we will in time. Here's the last question to Fred. Yeah, so, so our sensitivity, yeah, it's a good question. So our sensitivity basically depends on three things. Um, one is the time span of the experiment. Um, that gets better with the combined data because Parks has some data that goes back like 30 years. So this, the time span improves. One is the number of pulsars, and that improves because there are more pulsars. There's about 100 in the whole IPTA versus like 70 that we're timing. And the third one is the cadence of the observations, which also gets higher. Um, you know, some of them, you know, we time the same pulsars as some of the other collaborations, but effectively, which a much higher cadence when we combine the data. So that's the primary, primary sensitivity improvement. The other thing you mentioned, it is also like a really useful check on the data to have pulsars observed with different PTAs. Um, but that doesn't really, like that check itself doesn't really improve our, our, our sensitivity. You know, we do that and that helps us tease out like any problems with systematics. So, so it is really useful, um, but it's the time span, the cadence and the number of pulsars. Okay, let's uh, wind up this talk. Thank you very much for Thank this you. exciting talk.